Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Hookham, and I'm going to be talking about genetic algorithms. So this is supposed to be an introduction. You don't need to know about genetic algorithms. You don't need to know about fancy math. Uh, it might help if you know JavaScript, because we're going to be looking at an example in JavaScript. Um, the goals of this talk are just to introduce you to what's going on, um, give you a sense of what the power of genetic algorithm might be, and also maybe of some of the problems that you might face in trying to write an effective uh, genetic algorithm. And we're just going to look at a simple example today, but we're going to talk more conceptually about what the problems are in harder examples. Um, so what sort of thing is a genetic algorithm? Um, the word genetic there is meant to be the word genetic from like biological genetics. And so there's supposed to be an overlap trying to do the same thing that nature does, but do it um, to potential solutions to problems in large spaces. Um, Genetic algorithms are useful if you have a space that's so big that you really can't go and look everywhere uh, by hand, as it were. Um, so you can't systematically search the space. Um, uh, they can be used to solve computationally intractable problems like knapsack problem, traveling salesman problem, um, that are generally optimization problems. There are other techniques for dealing with optimization. Genetic algorithms are just one of them. Um, uh, they are, in fact, used in design and engineering. So you can make a bunch of you know, fake pillars to put in your skyscraper and subject them to simulated testing uh, and modify the pillars over time to try to get the best uh, pillar that supports the most weight without itself being heavy. Um, OK, so I said earlier that the idea is to mimic biological evolution. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, this is really the basis of the technique here, OK, is that we're going to do, we need to do four things. And we want to do them as independently of each other as possible because each serves its own important pur purpose in this overall process. So the first thing we need to do is just seed an initial population. We want our initial population um, to, uh, to be as random as possible so that they cover as much of the territory in the space of possible solutions to our problem uh, as they possibly can. Um, so instead of animals, in this case, we're going to be using strengths. We're going to be using uh, sequences of characters as our little creatures that we're going to be evolving, right? Um, the next step is, just like you imagine from genetics, you got to weed through those guys. So um, you apply some kind of a fitness function that you've got to write yourself. you got to decide what makes somebody a better solution to your problem than somebody else. Um, and it's going to be particular to your question, um, what is going to make somebody fit. Uh, then you're going to go and breed those guys. And what's important is that during breeding, which you can sometimes call crossover, you want information to, uh, to transfer between two members um, of your population uh, some way. So maybe you randomly swap certain uh, key value pairs if it's an object. Maybe you randomly swap members at certain positions in an array. Um, but some information transfers back and forth during this uh, so-called breeding process. Uh, and what's really important here is that the most fit people get to do the most breeding. Um, and so somehow you've got to design the breeding so that the most fit people have the most influence over the, what's going to be the next generation um, in your uh, iterative procedure here. Um, and then the last step here is that it might be that you started out with people who were pretty good solutions to your problem. And if you reconfigure them, they're going to get better. But maybe they were missing some little tweaking that would have actually optimized a little more. So you need to do mutation in addition to breeding. And it actually makes things better if you make the children be slightly imperfect copies of their parents. And how much different than their parents they need to be really depends on the situation you're dealing with. Um, and so each of these things you have to do every time that you try to implement a genetic algorithm for a new problem. Um, so for our simple problem, we're going to search the space of 12 character strings, um, which if we include capitals and lowercase and some punctuation, there's about 72 possibilities for each of the 12 characters. So the space is, uh, is 72 to the 12th, which is about 10 to the 22nd possibilities. It's a really large space. And if we just tried to randomly guess and get hello world, uh, basically it's not going to happen. Okay, It's not going to happen even if we keep guessing for a while. Um, so if we start out with random strings, Maybe it'll be pretty cool if we end up going from random strings, which have a very low likelihood of being in the world, and ending up with the correct solutions here. Right? So how can we design our genetic algorithm to start in this huge haystack and end up finding this little needle? So uh, we have to make these decisions. What are our seeds going to look like? Well, let's use 1,000 strings of random characters. 
Um, how are we going to decide who's the best? In this case, it's fairly easy because we know exactly what the most fit solution is, Hello World. We can just compare each string to Hello World and say, the more you have in common with Hello World, the more fit you are. You get a point for every character from Hello World that you have. You have a capital H in the first spot, you get a point, right? Um, and then maybe we say like, okay, if you're in the top 50% of fitness scores, um, then you get to breed. If you're in the bottom, you know, go home. You're done. Okay. Uh, and then the idea is that, uh, and then we got to mutate uh, maybe 10% of the characters. Let's just randomly switch them out for some other random character. Okay. So, you know, those are the decisions we need to make. Now we have to go and think about writing the code. There are a lot of uh, possible sort of uh, tools that you can use to do this. What I've been working with is this thing called genetic algorithm, which is just a node package. Go and install this package. It's going to give you a template that you can use. It's going to give you a constructor function that you can just invoke with this configuration object with the idea being that you get to decide. So this is, it's configurable to your specifications. And you have to write a mutation crossover and fitness function. You need to decide how big your initial population is and actually pass in a random seeded initial population. But that's it. So you're writing three functions and it's going to process the, the actual evolution. It's gonna take care of it for you, okay? Uh, and so it's really convenient. Um, it's really great. And then since these functions are independent of each other, it's really easy to tweak um, as well, the behavior of it. Now, this object is just, when we, once we invoke it with our configuration object, every time we call evolve on it, it's going to give us a new generation um, based on the functions that we passed it, um, applying them to each member of the population. We can call best to find out who did, who had the highest fitness. We can call scored population to find out about everybody. And we can actually reconfigure the way that it's running while it's running. Um, so in between steps of evolution, we could be keeping track of how many have happened so far. And we could say, if too many have happened and you haven't found a solution that's good enough yet, reconfigure yourself. So this last config option, you can call it and send it in new parameters, send it in a different fitness function right in the middle of the process of uh, conducting the evolution. So it's really awesome. Now let's look at uh, an implementation that actually does this, OK? Um, so I've written the code here to just do genetic string match, and I, I made my target string, and I've written up some functions. I've got this thing called zipper crossover that I do where I sort of intermingle the characters from the strings. Um, and I'm using 1,000 randomly generated strings um, to try to get at it. And so I think in advance, how many generations do you think it'll take? Do you think it'll take a minute? Well, here it is. Uh, yeah, 52 generations of 1,000 each. So. Um, and you can see at the beginning, it really is evolving. Um, we started with more or less completely random stuff. And as you scroll down, you really get closer and closer to Hello World, and there you see it. It's perfect. Right? Um, and so that's like pretty cool. It's OK, right? Because like, OK, we started with random stuff, and so we shouldn't really have made it. Uh, but the fact that we did, and then only 50,000 guesses, um, means that our fitness function and our crossover function were working really well to sort through this information. Gradually, um, now the thing is, this is just a kind of dummy example, right? Because this is a problem where we already knew the solution. And so it was easy to write a fitness function because we could just optimize, like point at the currently known solution to this problem. What if we didn't know the solution to the problem in advance? So then it would be more interesting to try to write a fitness function. Um, also, I mean, we wouldn't have had to, the, the alternative to genetic algorithm is not randomly picking uh, strings. We could have systematically searched, right? So since we knew the optimal solution in the beginning, we could have gone through all of the possible first characters until we found the capital H and added that to our solution, and then gone through the, the lowercase e and added that to our solution. And we could have done that in 864 computations instead of 50,000 strings, okay? So this is not a very good solution to this particular problem, but it is a solution, okay? Um, we're we're going to find more interesting problems if we uh, think about harder cases. And the kinds of challenges you can expect to face in dealing with a, a, a larger um, space or one with like uh, more interesting features um, is going to be, uh, since you don't know in advance what the right answer to your question is, you'll get back an answer if, you, if your code doesn't break. And then the question is, what does that answer actually mean? You don't necessarily know that that is going to be even the, the member of your, of your possible solution set who optimizes using your fitness function. Um, and even if they optimize using your fitness function, you don't know that matches the real world because you don't know your fitness function was good. And so there, there's a lot of issues. Um, a common one is that you reach a local optima, what's called a local optima, and you get trapped there. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, 
So you get premature convergence. If you're too aggressive in selecting only the, the fittest members, um, maybe you started in like, let's say your fittest member was capital H, lowercase e, L, um, but then all the other characters were wrong. Well, if you seeded out everyone who only had one character, they maybe had that one character that you really wanted, right? That would have helped you get to Hello World. But if they're gone and that's and the only person you had left after the first round was HEL, now you're just randomly trying to get to Hello World. And guess what? You never will because the solution space is enormous. So even if you're randomly mutating the string, you're basically back to guessing. So it's really important that you preserve genetic diversity and that you have a fitness function that's designed to weed people out, but not too many people, okay? Um, and then, okay, so and you don't know if you really did solve the problem. Another issue is that this hello world uh, situation has independent parameters. So that whether you should have a capital H really doesn't depend on anything else about you if you're a string, right? So what if we had parameters that instead were more like this giraffe and this shark, okay? So um, in hello world, whether I should have a capital H, I should. If I'm a giraffe, if I'm a shark, I should have a capital H because the fitness function just says have a capital H. But what if I'm dealing with a more complicated situation where whether I have a long neck or not actually depends on other things about me? Now it's going to be a lot more complicated to say what generates fitness for me, okay? Because you can't just go like, well, you really want to have a long neck and eat long branches. How am I going to cross the giraffe with the shark in some interesting way, combine the information from these members of our species? So maybe this is just a terrible way to design the phenotype, we have to go back to the drawing board and redesign our members so that they can be bred with each other and generate interesting solutions and be tested for fitness in interesting ways, right? So um, more complicated problems, you get uh, more complicated issues. So I mentioned before the idea of a local optimum, which is a really serious problem. Genetic algorithms actually are a way um, to try to get around problems with local optimums that you have if you just try to find uh, solutions uh, more or less systematically. Um, so if you imagine the solution space, um, we could think about this sort of gnarly curve here um, as a graph of fitness. So it, just for example, if you think of it as mammals combined with their environments, maybe there are millions of different ways to stick a mammal in a different environment, right? So I'm a, a cow that lives in a shoe. I'm a human that lives in a house. I'm a, right, I'm a chimpanzee that lives in the desert. Um, and then we could say, okay, well, maybe it's some kind of fitness function where we're trying to maximize tool use, right? Then you could start to think about like, well, who actually maybe would be this green dot and this red dot, right? Well, maybe there are creatures that are pretty good at tool use, but they're not the best, right? So if you're this green dot, you're one of these mammal environment combinations that leads to pretty good tool use, but not the best. You wanna actually be on this much steeper curve in order to get to the red dot, right? Now, the issue is going to be if you think about in terms of the way our genetic algorithm works, we were picking random people from this population at the beginning and hoping that as they improved, every time their fitness improved, they would be headed towards our global uh, optimum, which is this red dot, right? Um, so in our situation, maybe we're thinking about it as the red dot, the people who use tools the best are humans in post-agricultural communities. And maybe the green dot is chimpanzees live in the forest. They do a pretty good job of tool use, right? But we're not the best at tool use, right? And so if you think about this um, curve right here is so steep that it's very unlikely that even if we seeded tons of people here across the spectrums from zero to a million or a billion, it's very unlikely that we pick somebody who fit inside of these initial conditions that we're gonna lead as you uh, march up this fitness curve that we're gonna actually lead you to this red dot, right? So if we think of these as capturing all the individuals who sort of uh, start out anywhere from one end to the other of the curve, um, it's really hard if you're at this green dot to mutate in such a way that you get out of here. You'd have to mutate a lot, right? And it'd have to be just the right amount of mutation um, in order to make it so that you end up here. And every mutation that you do that's smaller than covering the distance from the green to the red dot is actually going to hurt you, is going to make you less fit. And so you're going to die. You're not going to be able to breathe. So you get trapped here, okay? And when that happens in your, in, when you're doing a, a genetic algorithm, it's bad. It, but it's not just for genetic algorithms that this problem exists. This is a general problem about optimization that genetic algorithms actually help with because starting with a random population makes it at least possible that we started with somebody who is in here um, so that we'll hopefully end up on the red dot. And if we do it over and over again, and if we have good um, selection and crossover functions, hopefully we can minimize the chance that we missed our global optimum. So, you know, general point about global uh, genetic algorithms is like, we don't necessarily know that we found the best solution, but we, we, Maybe if we just want a good enough solution, if we just, if the green dot is good enough for us, 
you know, maybe we wanted a strut that would do the job, right, better than most struts, um, then the green dot is maybe good enough. Um, and if we need a good enough answer, gen algorithm oftentimes will be a good way to go. Um, and obviously, the genetic algorithm is going to do better um, against local optima than just um, hard-coded solutions. So it might not be as good as other possibilities. Um, one thing that's great about genetic algorithms is that they're really easy to get started. Okay, so uh, you know, I'm telling you today, you could go and get this node package, um, and without learning, you know, linear algebra like you might have to do to start doing neural networks, you could make uh, code that does exactly what my code does, or maybe even something more interesting. Um, but it does require a lot of fine tuning. So there's no general principle about what makes a, ge a good genetic algorithm good in all cases. You have to look at the particular case and design each function for that case. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error. Um, but that's pretty much all I have to say. Uh, thank you. Do you are there any questions?